Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, you're an incredibly perky group for this time of day. Um, but, uh, and the good news is I really don't have a presentation. So that, that I'll, I'll take that worry off right now. Uh, but I do wanna talk about a few things that are going on. And I do wanna hear mostly about what concerns uh, you guys as an industry uh, about the wonderful uh, machinations of what goes on here in City Hall from time to time. Um, so uh, yeah, the swearing in was Tuesday. Uh, so when we had our first little meeting was for just committee assignments and whatnot, and we don't really get into the nitty gritty until uh, the 25th because of the Martin Luther King holiday. Uh, and we won't be approaching, uh, I have not seen uh, that little 2% proposal on the future agenda yet, so I don't know when it's coming. Uh, frankly, I don't know if it's coming. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what we can do about that. Uh, clearly, that's got to be a concern for for everyone, um, it was a proposal made uh, certainly without findings, uh, without cause. It was a number that they threw against the wall. I don't have to explain any of this to you guys, you all know so well. But one of the biggest concerns I think I've heard from your industry has been about this idea of a registry and which would be an onerous, expensive thing to do. And, uh, I mean, it's clearly one of those things that they're just, they keep throwing things at the wall to see what sticks. It kind of reminds me of my old college roommate would cook pasta and throw a piece of spaghetti against the wall to see if it was done yet. And that's precisely the way we're doing, we're doing policy right now. So we're gonna hopefully rein that in. Um, but um, when I was last on council, we had that ad hoc group as you, probably all well uh, remember, well, we had John Justice do the mediation and we talked with the people from CAUSE and we asked some folks from your industry and we thought we had a consensus deal and then my council turned around and, and uh, rebuked it, which uh, was, was amazing in of itself. Um, but what came out of the thing was, of course, was the uh, mandatory uh, written contract with the with one year of renewals and all that kind of thing. So, um, and why I bring all this up is I know that it affects your marketability, your clients and your property value as far as investments and whatnot. So I, I think, uh, I'm sure I'm gonna hear back from you that these are still uh, concerns of yours. Um, but you know, the overall feeling that we feel like we need to interfere or be involved in the private relationship between a landlord and a tenant, which is a private, contract and arrangement uh, is something very foreign to me. And I'm not, I know where it comes from. I just don't know what the logic is behind it. Uh, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll find out about that. Uh, one thing I, you know, as, as you guys may know, I talked to Krista Pleiser a lot. I don't know if she's in here this morning or not. Uh, but there she is. Good morning. Uh, and I try to stay on top of what your industry is doing uh, with, with Krista. And uh, one of the things that, um, we talked about when I was on council, I wasn't sure where we were in terms of when we do have properties that are bought for investment and go into the rental market, uh, we were going to produce or some, produce some kind of informational packet. And the reason why I bring that up, uh, not that the other side has brought it up because nobody seems to go to the rental housing mediation task force, but knowing all those things are available, it's going to take a lot of pressure off of uh, the momentum these folks you know, think they have going into these, these discussions. And so I would like to work with your industry or your office to ensure that people understand where they can go, how they can do it. Uh, I certainly have uh, championed funding the Rental Housing Mediation Task Force fully. And we have Andrea and we also have another attorney on staff as well as a lot of volunteer uh, people to, to help mediate that. And to me, we've done, we've gone over and above our due diligence uh, as a community to do this. And because real estate is a big part of our industry, along with hospitality, real estate agents, you know, you guys do a lot in terms of our economic engine. So it's important that that's understood. And it's important that we respect that as not just a one-sided argument. It's, there's two sides to that, that arrangement. Um, going back to, uh, things that are going on in Sacramento. I've been speaking already with a couple of our regional mayors and I'm hoping to communicate more 
regularly with them, along with our state Senator Monique Lamone. Uh, and uh, now that Greg Hart's running for assembly, we'll have another, uh, another ear up there. Uh, I'm a little concerned, uh, and I don't know how you guys feel as a group about some of the stuff that comes down from Sacramento. It concerns me, the heavy hand of, uh, of remote government is always something that's, I think, a concern for a community, particularly a community that has prided itself on uh, very thoughtful planning. And the thoughtful planning, I know, sometimes is a real pain, but it is what Santa Barbara is, and it is what you guys sell uh, in terms of this community, its aesthetic, and the feel that we have uh, as a, you know, a relatively small beachside town that has a lot of big city aspects to it, but it also is still a small community. Um, so I'm concerned about that. I'd love to get feedback from, from all of you on that as well. Um, and other than that, I don't know specifically to your concerns and whatnot. I don't know what else I could present at this time. So what I'd like to do is I would like to hear from you guys to target what it is that we should be focusing on. Uh, I got a feeling I'm, what I'm going to hear about the 2% uh, rent cap proposal uh, and the registry. Uh, but, uh, and I, those concern me as well. I don't think we're, uh, yeah, there's going to be a big problem there. So um, yeah, if we can, I would love to, uh, I would love to respond to uh, whatever you've got going. I see Krista's got her hand up. So maybe we should start with Ms. Bleiser. Hey, Randy, thank you. Um, so I do have a question that has been kind of popping up in discussions and wondering if you've heard anything about it. And I'm sure some of our members have probably heard about it too, is a little thing called a vacancy tax. Um, quite a few people have been kind of hunting that idea around, nothing has really gained legs that I know of, but would you mind kind of explaining it um, to our members a little bit about what a vacancy tax could potentially look like, as well as is that even gaining traction or is it just something that people like flinging around? And I assume, Chris, are you talking primarily about the commercial properties? Well, commercial, but I'm also hearing residential. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard that one too. So the only examples that I've heard from other communities around the country has been on the commercial. But uh, as these different organizations that are putting together, and I forget what there's a specific name of the group, like it's almost like a timeshare where you have multiple investors buying a property and, and what that would mean. Boy, would that be easy to enforce? No, it would not. Uh, the vacancy tax on uh, commercial properties is something that comes up with our vacancies down on State Street. And as everybody here knows, there's a lot of old uh, time families that have properties that have such a low basis in it that sometimes they just leave them vacant, and take the right off or they can't agree what to do with them and so on and so forth. And there are communities like I, one I can think of is in Palm Beach, Florida. One's uh, just a couple in California where they, they try to do that. Uh, the downside of that is, of course, you end up with the next yoga studio or nail salon just to have something in there that they can quote quasi pop up. Uh, also, in a place like Santa Barbara, particularly in our downtown, it's a little, uh, little ironic to me to, to try to punish the property owner when the city itself is not doing its job in terms of maintenance and cleanliness and, you know, the the law and order that we need to have downtown, particularly downtown. Uh, the residential one, I don't know, uh, Krista, what, uh, I haven't heard of other community examples. You would probably be more on top of it than me. Uh, but uh, once again, that's one of those things where you can make a regulation. We do, we do a lot of stuff in these white walls here in City Hall that have no possible enforceable mechanism. Uh, plastic straws, that'd be a great example. Uh, and so going forward, what is it going to take to make the community hum and do what it's going to do? My thing is, and I'm not speaking to residential, I'm back to commercial now. I want to meet with these individual property owners and families and entities that have these properties and just say, please help me avoid going to ordinance committee with some, some kind of overriding regulation like that, because there's a lot of downsides. And I also think that once again, our fair share, our job to do the broken window uh, 
analogy is to fix the broken windows downtown so that everybody is ready for business. I mean, right now we don't look like we're ready for business. And that's, you know, I said a few comments about that on Tuesday. Uh, I really want us to be, uh, we want to be in a position where the city is no longer anyone's reason why things aren't working. And that would be, that would be uh, an overriding goal. And I don't know that uh, going into the neighborhoods and trying to create that kind of activity on a residential property, uh, I don't know how you could do that without being particularly invasive. I don't know how you do it from an enforcement basis, whether it's going to be like all the, a lot of zoning codes, but it's done on a complaint basis. Um, that seems like a slippery slope. So, but, you know, honestly, I don't know much about the residential part of that. Thank you. Good question, Krista. Um, in the chat, we have a, if somebody or yeah, Randy or Krista maybe as well, could you define a vacancy tax for everyone? Just to kind of give a kind of a brief update of what that would be. Go ahead, Krista. You're probably okay. about this one. <laughs> Um, so basically, a vacancy tax is where the government would come in and tax the property owner um, a specified amount because there is nobody within that property. So on top of paying your property taxes, plus all the other taxes and fees and you know utility fees and things like that, you would also be assessed a vacancy tax on top of that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, the irony um, would be there too if you have the vacancy tax and you still don't have a legal STR uh, plan in residential, most residential areas. So if somebody went away for six months, what do you do? And I, I just, it's just a, a nightmare, a, a nightmare web of overreaching government that I just don't think has a functional arm that's going to have an overall community benefit and certainly isn't something you want to lay as your next disclosure for your for your transaction yeah um another one uh randy from the chat says uh how is city handling sb9 or the ability of either splitting your property and or building a second home so what i understand todd is that uh what we do with sb9 is, is try to do a restriction in the high fire zone i don't think we've done more than that with that so far. Uh, as you know, we have the thing about the, the, the ADUs. Uh, we have a lot of different regulations that, uh, you know, this usually Scott Weiner, Tony Atkins, people like this in Sacramento, they literally put a bill on the, on the governor's desk almost every other day. And uh, I was talking to Monique about this and Monique did not support the bill. She didn't, she abstained, she didn't vote against it. But, um, SB9 does provide some freedoms for property owners. However, uh, I see some downsides. I see some downsides in perhaps low income and immediate middle income neighborhoods for that. Uh, I think a traffic and parking and circulation issue is a problem. As we, as we look to density as a solution for, for, for residences or, or affordability, uh, we also have to look at the quality of life. The quality of life is that if you, if you live somewhere in Santa Barbara and the idea that you're going to, to take the bus for all of your transportation needs is just, is just a pipe dream. And if you're paying anywhere close to market rent, you're gonna probably be working in Carpentry or Goleta. You're going to, you're gonna need a vehicle. And if you don't have a vehicle as part of your property deal, you're gonna park it in somebody else's neighborhood. Uh, I just see a lot of, of downsides. I mean, at some point, I don't know where density all by itself has created affordability, certainly not Santa Monica or San Francisco or, or LA. Uh, but I do think that unless until we get to where we've diminished our quality of life to the point where these properties start to devalue because it's just, just not as nice anymore. Uh, and I certainly, excuse me, I certainly don't wanna go there. Thanks Randy, I appreciate that. Uh, so on a little bit of a lighter note, more fun note, I got a note, uh, it says, uh, is it possible to resume our parades, possibly along Carrillo Boulevard, uh, as long as State Street is closed for outdoor restaurant business? Um, can we clean it up and make it kind of Santa Barbara's living room, they're calling it, so. Well, that's funny, I just got off that meeting right before I joined this one. Nice. Uh, it was actually the presentation from the Tess Harris, who's doing the, uh, she's the State Street uh, pl uh, planner. And uh, so the first thing is just gone on is the new 
oh, there's some acronym that goes with this, the, the new the emergency regulation. You know, we, our emergency order for COVID is actually, that's expired. We've done a new emergency economic thing now. And there's, like I said, we have an acronym for everything. I'm not sure what this one is yet. But in any case, uh, it has to provide for a 20 foot fire lane uh, which is a state regulation. It allows us to get our ladder truck up and down State Street. So it's really a concern to those businesses that built these parklets. And we still are a hybrid. We're not really a promenade. We're not really a, uh, a street. Uh, we're a closed street that has bikes and some parklets on it. And we've got the wide open sidewalks where the pedestrians are. Part of that's kind of working, part of it's not in terms of the aesthetics, in terms of the full on uh, uh, thing going forward. The promenade idea is relatively popular, is very popular in fact, but uh, the downsides are uh, it's working for the food service businesses, but is it working for anyone else yet? And I think there's a, it's a real mixed bag along those lines. And there's our few blocks, as you know, you've got the 500 block that's, that's busy, and then six, seven, eight hundred blocks have zippity doo dah, and then it goes up and starts building up again, another lull, and then you finally get up to Victoria. So, would we be then the longest promenade in uh, America, which I think would be which be the case? And, you know, and that's that's that that's the uh, the committee that's going to be working on that. They're going to be trying to answer those questions. In the meantime, the, the question about parades, I have spoken old Spanish days. And uh, I think there's a possibility that for at least one time, we may be able to stage down at Dwight Murphy, move along Cabrillo, and then go into the, uh, the Carriage Museum. I think that might work for one time. It doesn't handle the capacity of the people we've had in the past, and there are other logistical problems that go along with it. Uh, the rest of the parade, Solstice, Fourth of July, and whatnot, I think all of those could be accommodated in the, within the 20-foot lane. What this new regulation or new ordinance is going forward wants to have people do is respect the 20 foot lane, but make their parklet materials uh, portable. In other words, be able to move them off and have those occasional parades. So uh, I'm sure you've heard the grumbling already. Those notices just went out the other day. Uh, I haven't really been in the, I just got I'm new on the job, just got here. So I haven't really gotten a lot of, uh, I've got a fair amount of email I haven't looked at yet, but I haven't really gotten into the nitty gritty of it. Um, the Parkland thing is, is an idea that has been on the books since probably 1964 in terms of planned Santa Barbara. And not, not Parkland, but uh, the closing State Street to linear traffic. And uh, I think on some level, at least some box will remain that way. Maybe the whole thing would be, and we could use electric shuttles to, put, to bring people up and down State Street. Not really sure what the what the overall uh, look is going to be. We have to make business vital. We have to make we have to you know get back to a very robust steam cleaning program of the street. I would love to get rid of a lot of the planters and things along the street and make it as wide open to have the wide open sidewalks as we can. And I am planning to get together with HLC to making a lighting plan. I think if we light it and we clean it, we're gonna take care of our, that kind of environmental solution, we're gonna take care of a lot of our security problems as well. And make all those properties, uh, as I've spoken to some of the commercial real estate people, uh, a lot of folks have people in the wings that are kind of, you know, and they're negotiating a new lease rates, they're thinking they wanna be in business, but they'd really like to see us clean house first. And I think that's, that's a, very legitimate, uh, a very legitimate concern. Awesome, thanks Randy. Um, so another one that came in here, it says, is there any chatter to take any of the state surplus and use it towards mental health support services for the homeless? Yeah, that's happening on a state level. Uh, here's my plan locally is this, uh, that we, you know, we did get some of that, the, the money that we had to backstop some of our reserves on because we took about a $30 million hit during the during the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the fact we're so heavy hospitality related along with retail that uh, we, we took a bigger hit percentage wise than a lot of other communities. In terms of the, the grand funding from the state, yeah, the governor's uh, budget does uh, put money into it. My fear is this, or my 
overall statement is this. We tend to, in government, measure a program by how much money we put into it rather than what it does. What a great program. Look how much money we spent. And I think a lot of times we've done these things and done them over and over and over again. They haven't been that effective. And even though housing is an answer, it's not the answer in my mind. So uh, what I've been working with the chief on uh, is trying to up our level of civilian, non, not civilian, but non-sworn uh, presence. Uh, and this, this is gonna take a while because we're, you know, everybody's down on personnel in general. And be able to maintain contact with people and get them to the right services. We have a lot of folks out there that are just there. Uh, we have a lot of folks out there that really can't help themselves. And that's what we have to triage this entire bolt down to get to those folks. But right now the tail is wagging the dog. We've got a very small amount of people that are causing a huge amount of problem. We do not and will not have the sworn off officers for a little while. I mean, it's just, we're down 30% on our cops. Uh, recruitment has been really hard. So we're gonna have to find other ways to do this. So. Uh, as you know, there's that uh, housing thing coming up on Santa Barbara Street, which is those 33 little units of uh, modular units. It's a temporary thing. I don't know how that's going to work. They say they're going to have uh, security and targeted services there. Uh, I've been working on another plan with another group about another set of remote services where we could have bridge housing services, training everything in one one place i'd love to do that but that's also one of those kind of long-term plans but yeah as far as the counseling and the social work goes um you know it's like digging a digging a tunnel in the in the sand with a spoon it's it's hard because you make one scoop and one fills back in and we seem to see see a lot more mental disturbance on the streets today than we have in the past uh so uh, i think we just have to do what we can to be present I think we have to do what we can from the city standpoint to be clean and light because those are the kind of things that help. When you, when you clean a place up and when you light it well, you tend to have less problems. It's just, you know, that's just the way life is. And I think that'll be, that'll certainly be my focus and my job is to promote that along with as much authoritative presence as we can possibly muster. The rest of it, I say we can support whatever we can support in terms of psycho, uh, psychological services and those kind of things. Yeah, um, but once again, if it's just dumping money down the same black hole, I'm a little, I'm a little pessimistic. Yeah, thanks Randy, I appreciate that. So a couple more here. Um, says, uh, current status of the future of long-term rentals, either in the city limits or the coastal zone, seems like no one knows what the rules are at this time and maybe up in there. Okay, very good. I knew you guys were gonna bring that up. Um, yeah, so uh, what a lot of people don't understand about the cracky decision of what happened to the coastal zone, no code changes have happened per se. What that cracky decision was, was about our ability to make a special enforcement team without having gotten a coastal development permit. Lord knows I don't understand how that ruling worked the way it did, but it did. So uh, STRs, uh, as many of you know that I've talked to, I mean, the city was a bad actor years ago by collecting TOT on the illegal STRs. And so they're, they're either legal or they weren't. And I'm, I'm frankly agnostic about it, to be honest with you, in terms of the actual qualitative uh, arguments of whether full pro or con STRs. Uh, but we have the laws that we have, we have the codes that we have and have for years. I think a nuance may be this, because the Coastal Commission seems to want to have affordable visitor serving units within the coastal zone. Now, no finding has been made about what's affordable and what's not. I mean, they're just overarching statements. To me, I think one of the issues is, is that the process to become an STR, uh, which basically makes you a hotel and a hotel in perpetuity is one of the parts of the problem. I believe, and this is just me talking, I haven't run this by anybody, but I believe we need the process more straightforward and easier for people in the coastal zone where hotels are already zoned to be able to do that. I think that may be a way to 
have some, but not everywhere. The issues you're going to find is for everybody who wants to do STRs, you're going to find a lot of other people who say you're going to kill the, the rental housing market. We're going to do this and that. I know about all the arguments both ways. I've certainly talked to enough of you guys about it over the years. Uh, and that's, you know, that's going to be one of those decisions to work out. But I do think we can make the process more clear. And like you said, Todd, nobody knows what the rules are. Nobody understands the rules and certainly not the public. And, uh, you know, I've talked to actually a couple of real estate agents and I go, you know, be careful about selling this property with this, you know, cash flow as part of the part of the carrot, because it's still up in the air what we're going to do. Uh, they still aren't legal out in most of the residential zones. Um, we still collect, uh, well, the, the TOT thing, I mean, that just that just drives me nuts. So. <laughs> Uh, but if we can make the process so that an investor in the coastal zone, and that would be primarily between, oh, uh, where the coastal zone, excuse me, where there are already hotel zone. So between the zoo and, and Castillo, um, that may be a, a, a kind of one of those uh, split the baby things. I don't know. I don't know how, how feasible that is. I don't know how many properties that encompasses or if that's even the real solution to this thing. Awesome. Thanks, Randy. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, so let's see, we've got, uh, Jean, you had your hand up. Do you still have a question or did you get answered? Uh, no, I still have a question, but it was a little bit longer. So um, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you for serving. You're very appreciated. Um, so going back to your statement about getting some civilian help, um, I thought personally that it was very helpful the time frame that we had like a red vest or red beret type of people down there, civilians. And we did have rules that said that somebody couldn't come up as soon as you walk out of a restaurant with your uh, doggy bag, they couldn't hit you up. You know, sometimes I walk downtown from where I am up by Cottage Hospital and I'll get it hit up, you know, six times. But then something happened and I don't know if that's a partisan, everybody needs to be able to do whatever they want thing, uh, but that got taken away like that was their free speech or something. And I thought that that was a really good idea to make, especially since our restaurants and tourism is such a big part of it. Well, and then you're talking about the ambassador program, which is, yes, uh, you know, actually something I started based on my kid went to school down at SC and on Figaro Avenue, they have these, these non-sworn uh, patrols up and down the street, mm -hmm. which bang for your buck wise is you know, really something. And we also have right. uh, Chief Mel Malekian has those guys in the, the older guys, the VIP guys in the tan shirts, which those, go, those guys are fabulous because they're like, you know, dad's on the street. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they really get a lot of respect from the different street people and whatnot. Eyes and ears is important. Presence is important for the confidence of those people that want to be downtown. The rules so you, you do have these, you know, begging, begging for alms is protected under the First Amendment, right? The same thing as the Salvation Army guy or somebody quietly doing it. You're not supposed to be aggressive. And aggressive doesn't include speech. It includes like actually physically getting in your way, blocking your path, that kind of thing, blah, 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 blah. And uh, the good part is with panhandling is almost nobody has cash anymore. So that, that, that's, you know, that's almost going away um and on that level but you have people that are out there and a lot of them are just acting uh, they're, they're aberrations they're not acting like normal people or people down in luck they're just being aggressive you know presenting like they're psychologically unbalanced whatever it is and that's why you have to have as much as that as possible the red shirts are still out there there's only about five of them right now we're budgeted for 18 uh uh, Chief Malenkian has a plan to expand, has another idea for another kind of group like that, because when I did the ambassador program, when I was on council, I got a lot of pushback from the union, or you're going to do this, you're going you're to take, you know, we're going to have a blah, blah, blah. That's over. There's no more resistance to that. They appreciate it. We want to be the eyes and ears for them. Okay. You know, the, the social work that our cops have to do is not what they went through the academy for. And I would love to, going back to a question that Todd had earlier about, 
you know, social work and that kind of thing that we can do to, to, to provide services. It would be fabulous if we could take the burden off of our uniformed police officers from being social workers. They would love that. And it would be more effective. And it, you know, the mood around the country, or at least the, the mood for some folks around the country, so we've got really anti-cop. And our cops are just going, you got to tell us what you want. We don't even know what you want us to do. And I'm going, I, I think it's been really hard. It's been hard to recruit them. I say we're down quite a number right now, and hopefully we'll be able to we'll work to get that back. But in the meantime, if we can fill in with some more of these people. But, you know, everybody, you know, is having a hard time finding employees on any level to do anything. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're in a very strange little limbo right now. But, well, you know, I'm, that's a focus of mine. Big focus of mine. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Good question, Gene. Um, and just uh, some people were asking about some terminology there, Randy. So uh, TOT, transient occupancy tax, and then STR, short-term rental. I uh, know as you get going, you're throwing out that lingo. So I appreciate it. But uh, we just, live on acronyms. I mean, if, you know, if acronyms <laughs> were dollars, we wouldn't have a budget problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's see. We'll move on to a couple other ones here. It says, um, what's planned for um, Macy's and then also for um, the Nordstrom's, if you have any idea for Sears? I think there's three properties that are kind of in question. Any right. thoughts on that? Right. Well, um, uh, I did speak. I, I actually had a meeting with Pacific Capital Partners the other day, and uh, they're uh, obviously uh, excited about whatever it's going to take to uh, you know, allow them to do what they need to do over there to attract businesses and to build things back up. They're pretty optimistic. Uh, as you guys know, in the commercial property thing right now, other than residential, the uh, office is hot. Re retail is not. Office is hot. So uh, I've spoken to uh, the guys that bought the Nordstrom building and uh, they looked at it. They tried to pencil in housing because they know that was a big burr in the rear ends of everybody here in Santa Barbara. And they just they don't don't see it. They see the, what they they've got some plans for some large uh, tech uh, footprints. Um, and to me, if having uh, higher paid employees downtown is only good. Uh, I would love to see more residences downtown. I personally think that uh, the idea of doing affordable downtown is some of the most valuable property we have is, is a pipe dream. And it's probably not going to, no matter how many ordinances we pass, it's probably not going to happen because it won't pencil out. Uh, but going back to that, so you have uh, Norsum and Macy's both seem like they're headed for uh commercial use in terms of uh, you know, more office type use. Uh, Sears, on the other hand, uh, has been acquired and uh, that is likely going to be anywhere between five and 800 units in that area. Um, uh, when they get done, they're, they're going to do a specific plan for that. On top of that, you also have the old uh, Pepper Tree Motel, which is also going to be redeveloped for residences. And that's that's going to be one of those density questions. And of course, if you look at the it's different sequel requirements about how you mitigate all that traffic in a part of town that's already pretty trafficy, that will be interesting. So we'll see what goes on with that. As you know, uh, uh, Peter Lewis has a Staples building and he's going to do 72, 78 units, whatever down there. Uh, so this, I mean, there's over a thousand units in theory on the books and we keep talking about these plans for zone. I just go, what if we just focused on getting those things out of the ground and, and get things repopulated and get these offices filled and get these storefronts filled. And then we can talk about going forward uh, on the Carrillo commuter lot. We have a housing authority project that's going to be going forward. As you know, uh, there's another one down on Haley street, another uh, John price uh, thing that's coming out of the ground. And then uh, once we do the police station on the Dakota commuter lot, we'll be doing the, uh, there's a good chance that that property may be another housing authority opportunity. So uh, I think that, you know, the, the housing thing is a mantra, uh, it's a religion. I'm not sure what our carrying capacity is as a community, uh, but we'll see. Thanks, Randy. Good insight there. Um, so we'll just finish with this last one here. And again, I appreciate everyone's comments and uh, really good questions. So it says, uh, um, 
Any thoughts on doing anything about rising like petty crime, mail, packages, theft, bike, car, vandalism, et cetera? Yeah, if I could fire everybody in Sacramento and L.A. that uh, has a D.A. that won't do that. I talked to our D.A. quite a bit about that. And, and you know, she's disgusted. Uh, our sheriff is disgusted. You know, we have a, a very uh, active and very vocal uh, uh group of folks at the public defender's office that push back against this. And there's always been, we got to let everybody out of jail. We got to make everything below $950, uh, you know, kind of like whatever, like a citation at the most. So places like CVS, places like that are under siege. Uh, as I was walking around in San Roque during my campaign, a lot of folks were concerned about the Rose Motel and they were, you know, that's, and that's always been one of the higher property crime areas in Santa Barbara because you've got this, these beautiful neighborhoods, got a lot of nice stuff, but not everybody has really sophisticated security systems. So they've always been kind of in that, in that uh, epicenter of that. But with prop, uh, between Prop 47, uh, between the proliferation of, of, of drugs on the streets right now, there is uh, uh, an abundance of exactly that. Now, Santa Barbara, we're, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't want to shove it under the rug, but compared to other communities, we're doing pretty darn well. However, with our lack of PD right now, the lack of bodies we have, we're responding to what we can respond to, but the triage gets down for, I mean, the idea that somebody's gonna come out and, and talk about your TV, being stolen is uh, going to take whatever position it takes behind the violent crime, the threats with our firearms and that kind of thing until we can get completely remanned. So it's a focus for me. Uh, Chief Malekian is somebody I talk to a lot. Uh, uh, public safety is my number one job. I mean, that's, that's what we were supposed to do with your money, <laughs> do public safety. So, uh, We'll be doing that. I, th this Rose Motel thing at some point is going to go, you know, going to have it's, it's the, the money we spend is, is I, that just, and that's another subject altogether. Um, but I really think that the, the, the idea of dealing with property crime, getting back to where we can have, we can have enough personnel to have beat coordinators out in patrol and neighborhoods, making it so that the average Joe can can get a hold of somebody right away, dispatches a problem right now. Uh, we're working on a, on, a, uh, on a dispatch reform that's hopefully gonna bring us more quality dispatch as well, because that's, that's a big issue as well. Awesome. Well, Randy, again, I really appreciate you taking some time this morning. I know you're a super busy man, especially with a brand new job and a lot going on, but thank you for your just uh, open candor. And again, I appreciate all the questions and. Uh, Thank you so much, Randy. Uh, thanks for being on. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, as uh, as you guys know, uh, you know Chris, Crystal will be on my case uh, no matter what comes down the pike here. So uh, anything you need to talk to me about, you can certainly get a hold of me through her. And I'm always uh, ready to, to hear your concerns and the issues because you guys are out in the neighborhoods. You guys are on all the streets. And so your great eyes and ears for things that are going on that maybe sometimes we don't get out of these walls once in a while. We need to be out there more, frankly. But, uh, but hearing from you guys is, is always valuable. Awesome. Hope to see you downtown at some point. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, Randy. All right, you guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for your participation with that. Uh, and we are moving on to a really great segment now. We are feeling... I guess I'm going to say it. We're feeling Randy in the new year because we've got another Randy coming on here. We got Randy Freed. He's going to talk about our year in stats and how the amazing 2021 year ended up. Randy, thank you so much for putting this together and uh, let's jump into it. Morning, everyone. I have to tell you, I was very impressed with Randy Rouse, not, not just because of his first name, but the fact that he spent this much time talking to us. Very impressive. Anyways, uh, if you bear with me, I'm going to try and get the show on the road and see if I can do this right, which is not right. Hold on, we find the shared screen, right? Hold on. Bear with me, please. Yeah, without a doubt, uh, we saw this upcoming year unbelievable like we've never seen before. Um, it definitely wasn't boring. 
tell you that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to really look at, I'm going to go from the beginning and let's see if we can get this going. Ah, phew. All right. How's everybody doing? Can you believe it? January 13th, 2022. I'm starting my 44th year of real estate. It's amazing to think what has transpired since I first got on. When I first started real estate, I had a one page contract. It was eight by 14. Diana remembers that. And uh, we filled it in and now we're at 16 pages. What we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at the full year, we're gonna compare. And then I'm also gonna look at just December so you can see what's going on since December. So let's kind of go ahead and start if we could. I want you to notice a few things here. First of all, this is for the month of December of 2021. We had a total of 88 properties that closed escrow. Medium sold price, $2 million. This has been the first time that we've ever had a month where the median sold price was over 2 million. And look at our average sold price, basically 2.9. And you can see that our sales price to list price was over 100%. One thing I really want to point out is at the bottom here where you see active in range, 171. What that basically means is during December, 171 properties came on the market. And as of December 31st, we had 77 properties. But what I want you to look at is look over to the, to the right where I have in red. If you look at December 30, December of 2020, we had 306 properties come on the market. And look what it was like in December of 2019. We had 431 properties on the market. Look with our current, where we had the current of what is sold. You can see 77, but look what how many we had in December 31st of 2021. And then again, December, 31st of 219. It's amazing where our property has been, and what we've seen. See if this is switching over, there we go. Um, Bonnie, for some reason, my thing's not turning. Let's see if we can get this. Can you see this okay? Have hey, I lost Randy. everyone? We can see the zoom in, Randy. Okay, for mine's not going through. So let me see what, why it's not. Maybe, uh, maybe you're zoomed in, maybe zoom out. I'm trying to, there we go. Is that better? Okay. All right, so let's look at the difference between December of 2021 versus December of 20. You can see that we sold 88 properties in that December, where last December we closed escrow at 131. Look at our days on the market though in comparison. In, de in December of 2021, our days on market was only 23 days on market versus 44 in 2020. In 2019, we were at 65 days, just so you know. Sold median price for December, 2 million, and our average is 2.9. And again, we were over 100% of our sales price to list price. Look at a year ago. Now understand, you know, we thought 2020 was an unreal year. You're not gonna believe to see what's happened for 2021. Days on market, you can see 44 for last year. Our median price was 1.550. We're basically 450,000 higher for just the month of December. And our list price from 2.5 last year to the end of December of 80 of uh, 21, 2.9. So let's look at number of sales, we'll look at homes prices, and we'll look at the different statistics here. You can see from 217, 18, and 19, we were pretty, pretty average. We, we had a pretty well consistency. Last year we jumped up 100 in 2021 to 1300. And look how we've gone, over 100 properties sold more in 2021 than in 2020. Look at our medium sales price, unreal overall. Again, now we're looking year to year. This is for a full year. 
You can see 2017 through 2018, very consistent. Pretty much between 1,250,000 to 1,286,000. Big jump, 2020 to 1,550,000. And look where we are today with our, with our median sales price, 1.9. Pending sales. And before I go on, I do want to say one thing about the statistics. First and foremost, I want to thank Ani. You, this has all been sent to you. Ani spends her time at the end of each month putting these together. All I do is the presentation. She's the one you should thank for what we get and what she sends out. So I'm not going to embarrass you, Ani, but I just thought I would. So you can see our pending sales. Our pending sales are up about 27. Pretty consistent. Not too bad. But you, again, you can see that over the past two years, the pending sales have risen, just like the closing sales. We're seeing two things, which is very obvious in all of us who are in real estate. Supply and demand, and the fact that we're seeing probably close to 40 to 50% of our buyers coming from outside the area. Active listings. This is what's also interesting. Active listings are pretty consistent. So year in and year out, we still get about the same number of listings that come on the market. Now, last year we had a big influx, which is really interesting because we saw that we had a, a little bit of a suppression in 2019, because that's when the pandemic started. And then all of a sudden we jumped up to over 1500 homes and PUDs that came on the market. But we're still seeing around almost 1500 consistently throughout each year for the past five years. But again, our medium list price, look at the big jump there. That's about 280,000 higher dollars in price. Our medium list price has gone up. Again, you can see the consistency from 2017, 18 and 19. Not too bad, it's kind of a nice little level. Bump up in 2020 and a spike. And again, a, a lot of it deals with what you see was supply and demand. So now let's look at last year versus this year. We're going to take all of 2020 and compare it to all of 2021. I'm going to show you some statistics, which are even really more interesting. Our total listings, active listings down, very little, only just under 3%. You can see that's what about 27 homes that are on the market? Our new listings were down though, and that was about 7%. This is what I wanna to talk to you and show you here. Look at the median price. And we're gonna look at median price in two different ways. Median price, list price went up 18% from 20 to 21, from 21. From 2019 to 2020, we went up 19%. So in a sense, in the past two years, our appreciation has gone up 37%. You can see 18% is our medium list price. Properties that went into escrow, you can see the amount. Let's look at sold properties. Sold properties were just even more amazing to look at. We had 8% more properties sell in 2021 versus 2020. And if you add that in 2020 versus 2019, 14% more properties sold. Our median sales price was up 22%. The year before that, we were up 20%. But 22.6% is our medium sales price has risen between 2020 and 2021. Medium sales price without Hope Ranch, 23.6%. And again, the year before that, it was at 14%. We're seeing a very high, we used to always think, gee, if we can get three to 5%, wouldn't that be great? 22% and 23.6% between 19, 2020 and 2021. Our average sold price up 32%. Over $3 million is our average sales price. 
If we take out Montecito and Hope Ranch, it's still 27%, almost $2 million. We've never hit these numbers before. And look at your sales volume. Even the sales volume has went up 42%. As you can see, supply and demand and the fact that we're having so many buyers come out of the area has really increased the desirability of Santa Barbara. How about condos? Well, condos, you can see, with <clears throat> condos, we had 42 in December that sold. Our median sold price, 820,000. And look at that, our average sold price, nearly 900,000 for condos. And again, your sales price over list price, selling greater than our price. What you're really seeing is when you look at the market, and I say this all the time, we all know we have what's called a seller, we have a buyer's and a seller's market. But what we're to a great extent seeing is what's called a seller's auction market. And your list price is really saying to buyers, this is the opening bid price. If you look at the active in range for December, we had 45 homes or 45 condos come on the market. In December of 2020, we had 64 condos come on the market. And look at December of 2019, we had 112. Active. On December 31st, there were 10 active condos on the market. As of this morning, there are 15. But look in 2020, we had 20 condos come on the market on the market. And in 2019, we had 72 condos on the market on December 31st. Question always arises: how long is this going to last? At least with the supply and demand. Until we get a lot more, and I'm sure many of you have seen offers coming in where you're getting four, five, six, ten offers on a piece of property. Those are a lot of buyers who have not purchased yet. So until we get more inventory, our market's going to stay very active. There's no doubt about it. Comparing December 2021 versus December 2020. Days on market, 12 days versus last year, 35 days. Medium price, 820 for December of 2021, 747 for December of 2020, the median price. The only real difference was, at least for the month, we saw that, that our average sold price was 888, which is extremely high, where in, in December of 2020, it was 950,000. But again, you're seeing, look at close, the sales price, the list price, and what's happening there. Also, just so you know, December is where the Omicron came out. And so a lot of people kind of were hesitant as to what was going on with the pandemic. Number of sales, let's look at year end and we'll look at compare the past five years. Condo sales. Look at, look at again, I always like to look at comparing 2017, 2019. Very consistent. The pandemic hit and whoever thought real estate would be created so much activity. 479 sold last year in 2020, I should say two years ago, 2021, 558, 80 more sales basically in condos in 2021 versus 2020. Our medium sales price, look how much that has increased from just a year ago, from 737 to 828,000. And again, if you look how consistently we were before that, it was when we had properties on the market. Pending listings, again, we're up from 469, 544. A little bit over, just about 50 more condo listings are pending than in 2020. And the condo listings, still, again, about the same, not too much. You look at 2018 was where we had our high of 559 condos. We still have been consistent. Properties are coming on the market. People are saying there's nothing for sale. Properties are coming on the market. They're just selling very quickly. How many of you, when you put your listing in, say, we're going to look at uh, offers a week or 10 days after they come out? 
it, our market has really changed with that. <clears throat> and our medium list price, again, has gone up to 795,000 year end average. So how does this compare with December of condos last year versus this year? Total active listings are up. So, <clears throat> new listings are up 2%. So again, our listings are about, are very consistent. Median list price up 88% 80, to 795. And, and just so you know, the year before that, our median list price rose 9%. So for the past two years, it's gone up 9% and now 8.2%. Properties that went into escrow, almost 10%, as you can see. Every criteria with listings and condos has gone up. Sold properties. 23% more properties, almost 24% more condos sold in 2021 than in 2020. Our median sold price up 16% to 828, the highest we've ever been. Medium sold price without, a Mon without Montecito, still 14.5% to 795. Average sold price basically up 10%. Can you imagine our average condo sales over a million dollars? And the average sold without Montecito, 922,000. And again, our sales volume is up about 10%. But now let's look at just Montecito and we'll just look at Hope Ranch comparing the two. Year-end stats comparing 2021 and 2020. Sold properties in Montecito down 4%. But when you look at that, I mean, what is that? 13 properties, that's not much at all. Our median sales price up 38% in Montecito from 2020. Almost $5 million is a median sales price. Half above, half below. Our average sales price up 41% in Montecito. And our medium list price up 34%. Again, close to $5 million is the medium list price. And there you go. You can see where our average list price has also gone up. So the only place we went down was just listings, but very little. And so I'm, excuse me, in sold properties. How about Hope Ranch? Sold properties in Hope Ranch up 35%. Medium sales price up 40%. Our average sales price up 45% in Hope Ranch. And again, you can see our medium list price up 35%. You can see as, when you look here, what you're seeing with the average list price, everything has got up in both Montecito, very desirable, and Hope Ranch. This is what I have. This is a quarterly and actually a yearly update. This is an abbreviation of the slides that has already been sent to you. But if you'd like to have any of these that I've prepared, please feel free to email me and I'd be happy to send them to you. You can see everything has gone up. I wanna thank you all for taking the time to listen to my presentation. I hope you got something out of it. Again, two things to remember, supply and demand, and the fact that so many of our buyers are coming from outside the area. I wish you all safe and good health this year. Good luck to all of us. Be well. Thank you.